Moral relativism has become the backbone of our society. What is the true definition of tolerance? The myth of moral neutrality. Morality deals with principles of right. Hope is believing in God's promises. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today's session will be about morality and tolerance in, to continue our discussion about morality, what morality is all about, definition of moral relativism, arguments for and against moral relativism. Today I would like to talk a little bit more about tolerance, the overrated virtue of tolerance. What is tolerance? According to the dictionary, Tolerance is defined as such, recognizing and respecting the options, practices, or behavior of others. So first, tolerance demands recognition. Second, it calls for respect. Tolerance has now become our society's moral standards. If there's anything that is absolute in society, is that we ought to be tolerant to everything, every religion, every ideals, and every behavior. There's no such a thing as wrong, and it's very intolerant to label actions, ideas as wrong. So if you are intolerant of someone who is intolerant, what happens? You violated your own principle. And that's precisely the reason why the notion of tolerance does not stand the test of logic. If you are intolerant of my intolerance, then you have not practiced tolerance. Let me give you an example. I remember when I was working in San Francisco, right in front of City Hall in the city of San Francisco, um, there was this event, I believe it was two years ago, when the um, uh, gay rights movements have endorsed the um, uh, homosexual marriages between two men and two women. Um, I recall that in the lawn of the Civic Center of the City Hall, there were many Christians gathered together holding signs um, protesting for these marriages or for homosexual marriages, again in a very peaceful and civil manner. They have verses from the scriptures. Basically, the Christians in the lawn beside, right in front of City Hall were intolerant of such behavior, such actions, only to realize that those who are advocating gay marriages coming out of City Hall, bashing, saying, um, cussing, yelling, and screaming, and almost engaging in physical fights with those peaceful demonstrations from the Christians right across the street. What happens, what transpired before my eyes is that those who were advocating tolerance became intolerant of our, our Christian intolerance. So if you're advocating tolerance, that everything is permissible, that includes my intolerance of your actions. If you tolerate those who are intolerant, you keep your principle, but you sacrifice your responsibility to that principle. So a person who is completely committed to tolerance must resort to total indifference and silence. Once you say, no, I do not agree, then you have become intolerant of my objection or my intolerance. This is the logical fallacy of the notion of tolerance. Tolerance implies that we need to put up with something that is not liked. Think about it. If I agree with you, I don't have to tolerate you. Right? If I like everything you say, everything you do, then there's no really tolerance. It's more like agreement. So the notion of tolerance implies a pre-existing condition of, or a pre-existing notion of disagreement. It implies some kind of disagreement. But if you disagree, then you violate the whole principle of tolerance, because tolerance says everything is right. There's no right and no wrong. Everything is right because it's all relative to the individual. 
but if I tolerate you, I'm implying that I'm disagreeing with you and I'm going to tolerate you nonetheless. But why do you disagree if everything is right? Do you notice how that it's logically unworkable, unlivable? So tolerance, if you're truly tolerant, as I mentioned, you ought to practice indifference and silence. Once you speak up and you say, I do not agree, then you have forfeited your principle or your adherence to that principle of tolerance. This little image explains to you what tolerance is all about. The dog is talking to a, a little dog saying, let's celebrate our indifferences and diversities, even though you are clearly wrong. Let's celebrate our diversities, even though you are clearly wrong. So morality and tolerance basically says that it's morally wrong to say something is morally wrong. Doesn't stand the test of logic, does it? So what is the true definition of tolerance? What ought we to tolerate as Christians? And what ought we not to tolerate as Christians? Let's look at the example, our Lord Jesus Christ and his example in life. What did he tolerate and what did he not tolerate? Was he tolerant or was he not? Of course, out of all rel religious leaders that have ever existed, the Lord Jesus Christ was the most tolerant of all. He accepted sinners, adulterers, everyone, all races, all colors, all ethnicity, all background. He accepted all. He came for those who are sinners. So he was the most tolerant. But what did he tolerate and what did he not tolerate? A very important distinction that we ought to have, and that is people versus actions. We are called to tolerate people. We are also called not to tolerate all actions. We have to make that distinction. That distinction, we ought to love, tolerate, and accept everyone, because everyone is created in the image of Christ, and we ought to love everyone, but we ought not to love, tolerate, accept, and agree with all actions, ideals, and such. So making that distinction will give us a better perspective of tolerance, or a better, better understanding of tolerance. I tolerate you and I love you, but I may not necessarily agree with what you do. And that's precisely what Christ did. Tolerance, as someone, um, G.K. Chesterton, a Christian philosopher, he said, tolerance is the virtue of a man without convictions. Tolerance is a virtue of a man without convictions. And that is basically tolerance in summary. Other refutations of moral relativism or other arguments against moral relativism, it is self-contradicting. Moral relativism does not stand the test of logic. It is self-refuting. Let me give you examples. I'll give you a story. A professor, professor in class practiced relativism. He said, there are no absolutes. He went to his students one day and he said, there are no absolutes. Um, and he said, the class, based on his relative value, all women will flunk the class. That's his personal, individual, absolute rule and value. So all students protested and said, that's unfair. There's no way you can do that. But if fairness or justice is only my values or your values, then it has no universal authority over both of us. Right? If fairness or justice is only mine or yours, then there's no universal authority over both of us. But if there is an absolute value called fairness or justice, then it holds true for both of us. And it judges me as wrong when I say all women will flunk. Right? It will hold true for both of us. So, otherwise, all you really mean when you protest my value is that you don't like it. But you cannot logically tell me that fairness and, and, and justice ought to be executed and administered. But that's not what you said. You said that this is not fair and this is not just. But who's to say fair or just if this is only my value or your value? Which indicates that there's an underlying value, quote-unquote, law, that you and I must abide by and submit to, and that is called fairness or justice. 
So if relativists, or those who advocate moral relativism, were serious about cultural morality, they would applaud, for example, um, the Nazis for asserting their own culture values and not judging the Nazis' actions based on other cultures. But that's not the case. We know that the Nazis and what they've done were wrong. So, well, what is the point of reference based on which we say right or wrong? I thought we ought to be tolerant and we ought to tolerate everyone, every action, and every ideals. Another refutation for moral relativism is that relativists cannot criticize others. Based on what will you criticize others? Moral relativism advocates that every moral value is based on the individual and it's relative to the individual. So relativism makes it impossible to criticize the behavior of others because relativism ultimately denies such a thing as wrongdoing. Also relativism renders the notion of praise or blame as meaningless. How can you praise and blame based on what? What is the standard, the point of reference based on which you say this is good or this is bad? There's nothing good and nothing bad because everything is relative to the individual. Next time we meet we will discuss other refutations and other arguments that prove that moral relativism does not stand the test of logic. It's unlivable, unworkable, and it doesn't stand the test of reason. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.